righty. Good morning, church. How are y'all doing? Good. I'm glad to see y'all this morning. If y'all can and are able, would you please stand as we get ready to read scripture and pray? Our scripture this morning comes from 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, and it reads, The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. Let's pray this morning. Dear God, I thank you so much for allowing us to gather in your house. I thank you for the ones who are able to come, and I pray for the ones who are at home. Lord, I pray that no matter where we are, that we would go forth with the gospel of truth, that we would love those brothers and sisters in Christ, and we would encourage them to do the work that you have set forth for us. God, and I pray as we get ready to read scripture and hear the truth of the gospel being sung with songs and being preached with the word of truth, I pray that you allow Dalton to be used in a mighty way to lead us in worship. I pray as Ricky gets up here to speak the truth, God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would fill him to speak nothing but the truth and he would not shy away from that. And that the gospel would be the forefront of his message and that we would understand that and someone would today come to know that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior and would be saved. And Lord, I thank you so much and I pray that we can get home safely as well. And we do this all in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.
I'll tell you what, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Um, there's something about hearing the people of God worship. Um, and so if you sit in the back rows, you probably don't hear it as much as I do on the front row. So I want to invite you someday to move up towards the front uh, and, and uh, just to hear the people of God as they sang, His mercy is more. And to sing about the fact that all of our sins had been covered by Christ. Uh, to hear the church proclaim that truth in worship to God, it does a pastor's heart good. And I imagine it would do yours good too. So uh, there's always some empty seats right up here. Uh, so come and join me one Sunday and uh, hear the people of God worship. Um, this morning, as we continue our series through 1 John, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. So if you have a copy of God's Word, I'd ask you to go there, and we'll get there in just a moment. Um, but you know, last night, as I was, uh, usually Saturday nights, and I, I read and I study, as I prepare for uh, a series like um, I'll read before, when I'm in the uh, series before we're going to, and I'll study, and then as we come up to it, and I'll make my notes and all that stuff. But usually it's Saturday evening when I kind of finalize my, like I, I have my notes and all that, but I'd go and trim everything because if I were to talk about everything that I had to talk about, uh, we'd still be here tomorrow. Um, and so just praying and, and the Lord's direction about what to say, what not to say. As I was sitting there last night and uh, looking at the text, the Lord just uh, prompted me through the Spirit. And so I called Cooper over and I asked him this question. I said, Cooper, Tell me some things that you love. Well, it just so happened at that moment that he was eating some Starburst. He said, I love Starburst. It's like, that's great, buddy. He's like, well, I also love you, and I love mom, and I love electronics, and I love video games. And, and then uh, he kind of got through that. I was like, is, is that all? He's like, well, there's more. But then he looked at me. He's like, but of course, I love Jesus too, Dad. It's like, all right, thank you, buddy. And as he's sitting there, he's like, are you writing this down? I was like, yeah, I am. So, uh, but you know, that word love, it's, it's, a, it's a funny, fickle word because we say we love all kinds. I heard it this morning. Like I heard people saying, I love this cooler weather outside. And I do too. Right? And we throw that word around so much that I think over time that it loses its sense for what it truly is. We say that we love, like if you can ask Jacob, there he is. Jacob, there's a food that I love. What is it? Mexican food. There you go. And we have a running joke about that. But, but we have that, that, that sense and we, we talk about things that we love and we use it for little things that seem that, but then we stand uh, as on a day, um, as I did not too long ago, Christopher and Avery, and they stood and they took vows declaring their love for one another. And so I think of that wedding day and I think of Starbursts, and, and, and where, where do we find the balance there? And, and in Scripture, there's a wide use of the word love. In fact, there's several different words to help try and capture that idea. And in the Greek, there's, there's three words they do. There, there's this word eros, which deals with romantic love. There's also the word phileo, uh, that deals with brotherly love. That's where the city of Philadelphia gets its name. It's the city of what? Brotherly love, it comes from that Greek word phileo. And then the word that's actually, we're gonna see as we go through our text today, and that John uses in his letter is the word agape. And you've probably heard that before, but it's, it's a different type of love. It's not a, 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 a sensual love, it's not a brotherly love, it is an unselfish love. It is a sacrificing love. It is a love that gives without expectation of anything in return. And that's the word that we look at. And so we're going to look today and kind of what I've kind of titled this message is the love test. If you remember, we've looked at previous tests that, that John has been sharing as he writes this letter of how we can know for sure. What are some tests that we can take to evaluate to see if we are genuinely in the faith, that we are walking in the light, to use the verbiages that he used. And we looked at, there was a theological test. He dealt with sin and what sin is and the fact that we have a sin 
sin nature and that we do sin, but praise God, when we do sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us of all righteousness. And when we do sin, we have an advocate who is with the Father who is our propitiation. And praise God for that. And then we looked last week at that test of obedience. But this week we look at the love test and all of these things, if we are struggling with doubt of whether we're genuinely in the faith, not, not what we say, because he, we've looked at that, we said, hey, some say this, but they do this, then the truth's not in them. And we're going to see that play out in our text again today, but this love test. And so I want to read the text for us this morning, and then we will walk through it together. And so if you're willing and able to stand in reverence of reading of God's word, I'd ask you to do that. I am reading 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11 from the New American Standard. And this is what the word says. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now, and the one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Father, today, may you bless the reading of your word. Father, may it be clear to us today. Maybe we're here and we're struggling with with doubt. Father, we can know according to your word whether we are in right relationship with you, whether we are genuine believers. Father, I thank you for your word. Father, today, have your way among us, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. And so the first thing that I want us to see in our text is kind of a paradox that John points out here, and it's this. The first thing is it's the old new commandment, right? It's the old new commandment, right? What does he say right here in his text? He says, I'm not giving you a new commandment, but rather an old commandment. But then he turns right around in verse 8 and says, but I'm writing to you a new commandment. And some of you, like me, and you read that, and you're like, John, what are you doing? You, you can't say one thing and then turn around and say the exact opposite. But I think he can. And so let's walk through this today. He writes this text on the old, new commandment. Look at what he says again in verse 7. Beloved, and again, it's that term of endearment. He's writing, and this is how we know he's writing to the church and to believers. I am writing, I am not writing to you a new commandment, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. And so look at this. He's saying, look, I'm reminding you, I'm writing this old commandment to you. And so the question becomes, what's the old commandment? Because he never implicitly comes out here or explicitly comes out here and says, here's what it is, but we'll see it as we unfold through the text. And what he's reminding him of is the commandment of love. And we'll see that played out through the rest of the verses. And in fact, um, as he writes this, what would have been brought to mind would have been probably Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, where it says this, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That was an old commandment is, hey, you shall love the Lord, that you should love him. You should love your neighbor. We think about, passages like Deuteronomy 6, 5, where it says that God, there, there is one God. He is the one that we should love. And so we see that there. We see in Matthew chapter 22, remember in verses 37 to 40, when Jesus is asked, they're trying to trap him in all these questions. And they say, and they, they think they've got him. And they go to him and said, hey, uh, Jesus, what is the single greatest commandment? And they're trying to trap him. He's going to pick one, and he's going to pick this, and he's going to pick that commandment, or he's going to pick that one thing from the Mosaic Well, He's going to pick that one thing, and then they're going to be like, ha, I got you. You're saying everything else is diminished and not as great as that. But what was his response? 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the second is like it. You should what? Love your neighbor as yourself. And so that old law is Deuteronomy 6.5, and it's Leviticus 19.18, and it's love. In fact, what did he say after he said that to that person who asked him? He said, all the prophet laws hang on this, on this commandment to love. And so it's old. It's, it's been around before you and I. And so he was asked, and he didn't say, I'm going to give you something new. He said, this is what was established long ago, this commandment to love. And so he says there, look, beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment, but an old commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. And, and there's some debate about what beginning that is, and there's kind of three different ways that you can take that. One could be the start of your Christian experience in which you were confronted with the gospel and the truth of God's word and said, hey, you've heard this truth from the beginning of your time of Christian experience. It could also mean the start of uh, Jesus's public preaching and teaching ministry of which he was teaching and, and that but it can also just have a general sense of something, some truth from long, long ago. And, and I don't think we necessarily have to pin it down to any one of those because I think all three work. But he's saying this is not something new. It says from long ago it's been there, Deuteronomy 6, 5, Leviticus 19, 18. From the first time you began to hear about Christ or maybe you heard Christ or you heard someone teach who had been in the presence of Christ, or maybe from the first time, maybe you were out and foreign and you hadn't, and you were a Gentile and you came passing through and you were confronted with this truth. And so you heard that from the beginning, that we should love God and we should love others. It says it's old. The command to love is at the core of the Christian faith. It is at the core. In fact, we'll see it as we continue to go through 1 John. In fact, 1 John tells us that God himself is love. It says that God is love. It doesn't say that he is loving, which he is, but it says he is love. And so we see the old, and we say, well, that's great, but then we get to verse eight, and he says he's given us a new commandment. It says, on the other hand, while it's old, it's also new. I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. And so we say, well, what's new? And I think, and if you remember as we've walked through this, there's such a connection between 1 John and the Gospel of John. We saw it all the way back from the very beginning, the very first verse in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, what was from the beginning, whereas 1 John, or John, the Gospel of John chapter 1 says, in the beginning. There's such similarities that cross over, but you know, in John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus says these words, a new commandment I give you. Guess what it says? That you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. In fact, it goes on in verse 35, and he talks about the fact, this is how people are gonna know that you're in me by the way you love one another. And so we see that it's old, but then Jesus comes and says, I'm giving you a new commandment that you love one another, and you say, I know what you're saying. You're saying the same thing I said. It was like, wait a minute, Ricky, but you just said it's old. You show me scripture where it's old, but yet here Jesus is saying that it's new. Where, where do we find this? How, how does this play out? Do, do we get this? Do we understand? He says, a new commandment of which I'm giving you. Do, do we ever see this played out? And I thought about it. It's like, well, do I ever see an example of this anywhere and as I thought about it and I continued to read and study, I saw some different things. And here's one of the things. Anybody have an old favorite hymn? Yeah, what is it, Shirley? Jesus loves me. We sing a song here occasionally. I think, did we sing it last week? God so loved? Isn't that really an updated version of Jesus loves me? 
Don't we take songs? And so you take something that's old, and then in music, it gets a new arrangement. It gets a new tempo. It gets a new beat. Look at me, Dot, and talking like I know anything about music. <laughs> and so we say, while that's old, we still call it new, right? Like those lyrics are old. That song is old, but it's new in a sense. And so we see this played out before. And so while he's saying this, and you know what's interesting in the Greek, there's two different words for new. One has new in, in, in reference to time, like it's new, it's created, it hasn't been that old. Like you sit in here, many of you walked in this morning and you went, those drums are new, they weren't here last week. In respect to time, they are new. But the word that's used here is not that word. It's the word new that's used in respect to the quality of something. And so as Jesus is, as John is writing this, and he says, on the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true, and he's saying, which is the truth of this is evident in him. It's talking about Jesus. It's new because in Jesus, we saw the only perfect example of this command to love lived out in all of history. The only time in history on this earth that has been or will be of this commandment fully being lived out as it was given in complete obedience to love God and to love others was in the person of Jesus Christ. And so in respect to quality, it's new because it's the only time that it's ever been observed, fully lived out. It's been exemplified for us. And so what he says here, I, I, and on the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment, which is true, and the truth of this is in him. It's in Jesus. We see it. It's lived out. How, how, how do we see that example lived out? What do, what do we look at? What, what did Jesus' love look like as he looked out? And as I looked through Scripture and I prayed and I thought about things that I saw in Scripture, I thought about the woman at the well who was there at the time of day when nobody else was there getting water because she had a bad reputation. She didn't want to be there when people were talking about her and looking at her and sneering at her. And yet Jesus was there. He didn't say, something's not right with this, I'm going this way. No, he shared with her living water. As we look through scripture, we look at the tax collectors that Jesus loved. We think about people like Zacchaeus. We, you, Matthew was a tax collector. These were people that were hated. In fact, Jesus is criticized for dining with sinners and tax collectors. And yet he embraced them. As I look through the disciples in the way that he loved him, even though you look at Peter who denied, you look at Thomas who doubted, you look at Judas who betrayed, you look at James and John who wanted power and authority, and yet Jesus loved them. We look at the lepers that he touched. That he didn't turn and run the other way. As, as you approach the leper, they had to shout, unclean, unclean. And people would pass by at a distance so that they weren't ceremonially unclean. But what did Jesus do? He went up and he touched them. We see the blind that he healed. We see the righteous, the religious people. Nicodemus. We look at the way Jesus loved each and every one of these. And then ultimately, we, we look at all those examples as he walked through life and how he loved people. But ultimately, as he walked through life, it led to one place where that love was demonstrated. And that was at the cross of Calvary as he died for sinful mankind. He became the propitiation for our sins, the wrath of God was poured on him, the punishment was placed on him, the burden was placed to him, and he took it. And this is how Jesus loved. And so he said, in a, in a new sense, you've seen it lived out in a way that you've never, ever seen before. He 
says, because the darkness is passing away, the true light is already shining. Jesus is the light of the world. And when the light shows up, it dispels darkness. And so he's saying, now this, in him, this truth in him. But notice what it also says, but it's also in you. And you. And you. And you say, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, I'm not Jesus. But if we are in the light as he is in the light, then we are light as well. And so this should mean that it is being demonstrated the way that Jesus loved us, then we should turn around and love as well. And it should be exemplified in us as Jesus exemplified it for us. And as the light stepped into the world and darkness is dispelled, darkness is passing away because darkness cannot exist where light is. And so as Jesus stepped into this world, as light, and as those who have come and placed their faith in Jesus and repented of their sins and by faith confessed him as Lord, then we become light as well. And so that darkness, guess what? It's passing away because the light is already shining. The true light, Jesus. And so we see the old new commandment. Is it old? Absolutely. Is it new? Absolutely. You say, well, Ricky, I still don't quite under get, understand that, and I'm not sure I fully do it either, but that's what Scripture says. It says it's old, and it says it's new, so guess what it is? It's the old new commandment, because that's what Scripture says, that we love one another, and we're going to see this in the next, and so in these next couple verses, what happens is verses seven and eight that we just looked at serve as the grounds for what John is gonna say in verses nine through 11. He says, here's the ground, because this old new commandment, because of this old new commandment, here's what we see in verses nine and 11. Loving all believers is evidence that we walk in the light. There's that test. Remember, it's walk, if we love one another, this is the love test, how we love other believers. Do we love other believers? And so what happens in verses 9 and 10 is something John has already been doing in this text. He deals with a negative and then a positive and give us those examples. And so in verse 9, he gives us the negative. He says this, the one who says he is in the light, the one who says they are in Christ, that they have been enlightened by the truth of the gospel, and by their words they say, I am a Christian. I am in the light. The one who says that, yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. And what's interesting right here, that word hates in the Greek, it's a present tense verb which shows ongoing action. So if you remember from a few weeks ago, there was a word that I said you might get tired of hearing, and it's the word pattern, right? And so what this is saying is not a, a momentary moment where a believer succumbs to the temptation to hate someone because that will happen. And praise God, we have exactly what is said in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that he is faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And it's also true what it says in chapter 2, verse 1, that when we do sin, if we do sin, that we have an advocate with the Father who is the propitiation for our sins. Praise God. And so we will, but the one here that has a pattern, a habit, an ongoing state of hatred. If we say we're in the light, but our pattern of life is hate, what does it tell us about that person? They are still in the darkness. They have never genuinely been saved. You cannot exist in a pattern of hate and say that you walk in the light. That would be a paradox that does not exist. You cannot say that. that. Again, hear me. This is not to say that we won't have those moments where we mess up, where we sin, where we succumb to that temptation and we have that bitterness and hatred in our heart. But then we need to repent. But if that is the habit of our life, if that is where we live day in and day out, woe to us. The one who says he is in the light yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. Even now, 
It, it doesn't matter what you say. For 17 years of my life, you'd ask me, Ricky, are you a Christian? And for 17 years, I would have said, I'm a Christian. But I was in the darkness. Then notice in verse 10 what it says. It gives us the positive or the affirmative. The one who loves his brother. Notice how it moves from something that's internal hate, that emotion, then it moves to something that is observable on the external. It's not just what we say, but it's also what we do. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. So the one who loves, he says this, he abides. We looked at that in our previous, it has this idea of remaining and and surety, like like they know. It's continual. They have been enlightened by the gospel and that it is reflected in the way that they live their life to obey the commands of the Lord to love brothers and sisters in Christ. It's continual abiding. And so the one who does, who exemplifies, who just doesn't say but actually lives it out and it's evident in their life that says, I love my brother. And this word and the way it's used here is, is dealing with those that are a part of the spiritual family, the church. And that can be the local church, but I also believe the, the fuller realization is the church universal. We're not called just to love the brothers and sisters in Christ we have here at Lane Prairie Baptist Church. If we do, woe to us. We're to love all believers. Says the one who does abides in the light. They have confidence that they're in the light. They remain there. They walk in obedience there. But it also says a second thing about them. There is no cause for stumbling in him. And some of your translations might word that a little differently. The way it's constructed in the Greek, it's ambiguous at best about who it's talking about does the stumbling. And I think that's kind of by design. Because if you think about it, in one sense it could mean that, it, 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 that we, because we're walking in the light, we're abiding in the light, we're able to see, therefore we're not stumbling. We're not harboring hatred. And that makes sense, Right? You ever try and walk through your house at night? You know, sometimes I I get up early in the morning, like this morning at four o'clock, I woke up. And so I don't get up and like turn a light on so I can see where I'm going. And so I'm on the far side of our bed, so I have to walk around the end between the foot of the bed and the dresser and make my way. There has been a time where I turned a little too soon. And I'd say I did more than stumble because I wanted to cry when I got my big toe on the corner of the bed. (laughs) But it could mean that we won't stumble because we're walking in the light and we can see. But it also could mean the fact that we won't cause others to stumble. And I think both of those truths are reality. And I think the way it's constructed and it's ambiguous is, I think, in God's design to say it's both for us. If we genuinely love one another, and that is lived out in us, and, and, and those around us see that the way that we love people, and, and maybe the way that we love someone that's maybe sinned against us, and yet we love them, we've not become a stumbling block to anyone else around that saw that. They solved you who didn't repay evil for evil. And you yourself didn't stumble because you sinned by repaying evil for evil. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. And then in verse 11, we get a little expansion of the negative that takes place here. And it's going to show us about the one who actually has hatred, who they are. Look at what it says. It says, but the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. It says, this one that I talked about up here in in, in verse 9, 
The one who says he is in the light yet hates his brother. The one who hates, it tells us three things about that person. And it reiterates the first thing that was said in verse nine is that they are still in the darkness. And in a sense, what we see here is that which is internal, dealing with character. Like they are not in the Lord. They are not a genuine believer. They are still in the darkness. Even though they say one thing, their life is evidenced that they have never been changed by the power of the gospel. Or else they would love those that are around them, those that are of the faith. And I believe it's It's not even that. It's not just this is the context. We love one another, but we're called to love all of God's creation. And so their character, they're they're not in Christ. They're still in the darkness. And then it says that they that person walks in the darkness. And that speaks to their conduct, the way that they live their life, the actions. Of their life. And so, because their character and who they are is still in the darkness, then the things they do are of the darkness. The way they live, the way they hate, the way they're selfish, the way they indulge the flesh. So, the one who hates is still in the darkness. They walk in darkness, they conduct themselves in the darkness, but also. There's a third thing that it says there in the text. And that one does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. There is no direction. They don't know where they're going. They're in the darkness. Several years back, I was down in College Station. I had a friend of mine who was uh, the director of the Association of, uh, of Association of Baptist Students. Uh, it was the Missionary Baptist version of the BSM down there, still there, there, the ABS, Association of Baptist Students. There it is, all right? And they were having a, a college retreat, and he called me up and said, hey, I'd like you to come and speak to our college students. And uh, I've got a member of our church who's got a cabin and got acreage, and so we're all gonna go stay out there. We're gonna cook out there. We're gonna worship. You'll teach. We'll hang out. We'll have a good time for the weekend. And so we went out. We had a session Friday night. We did that. We're all hanging out. We're done with everything. And so these college kids decided they're gonna go out in the pasture and play capture the flag at night in the dark. And so they're running around and... um, I was a little bit younger then, but still not young enough. I was going to run around in the dark. Every time I go to stuff like that, my wife reminds me how not young I am compared to how I used to be. But me and my buddy Kyle and his wife Nikki were sitting there and a couple of the others who weren't running around in the dark. And the door swings open and a young man walks in covered in blood. As he was running, he thought he was going one direction, but in fact, he was running directly at a barbed wire fence. He had no direction of where he was going. He was in the darkness. He was blinded because of the darkness. So... He got a trip to the emergency room and some stitches. But it says here, the one who hates his brother is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and does not know where he's going. All this to say, this is the love test. How do we love other believers? And this is the application, this is the response and and, and the questions that I have for us to look at as we kind of finish up today is this, is do you love God's people? Do you? I'll take audience participation. Do you love God's people? I think everybody here this morning would say, yes, I love God's people. And so the question then becomes, every single one of them? 
the ones at this church, the ones at the church down the road, the ones that don't believe every single thing exactly like we believe it, the ones across the state, the ones out of state, the ones on the other side of the world. Do you love all people that are believers? Do, do you just say, I love God's people? Do you really mean it? And so the question becomes is we can say, as they said, you can say one thing, but then my next question becomes, how is it evidenced in your life? How, how you say, I love all God's people, then how is it evidenced in your life? Do you pray for them? Do you serve them? Do you give to them? Do you go to them? This is something over the past couple years that God has been at work in my life. Because, you know, the tendency of a, a local church lots of times is to feel like, well, I have to be in competition with the church down the road. I have to be in competition with that church and that church. I've got to do it better than them. They can't grow more than my church grows. And, we, and, and there's a fallacy right there as soon as you say, my church. And so way back when, when we went through that series through Colossians, God was doing a work in me saying, Ricky, it's not about just the Lane Prairie Baptist Church. It's about the church. And so you know what? I have pastors from this community that I text, that text me, that we get together and we celebrate what God's doing I got to text last night. I'm thankful for what God's doing at North Point up the road. Landon D's the pastor there. I praise God for what he's doing. But we pray for one another. I'm thankful for a young pastor named Tim Williams in Mount Pleasant, Texas at Gladewater Baptist Church who's doing revitalization work. Last Sunday after I left here about 2.45, I, God laid him on my heart to call. I called him. I got home, and then I sat in my driveway for a half hour more and just got to listen to him pour out his heart about where he's struggling in ministry. A 28-year-old young pastor who God's given me a burden for, so I pray. It's a church that you and I, whether you know it or not, you probably did at some point, that Lane Prairie Baptist Church has served because as he started there with just nine members, He said, you know what, it's kind of sad to gather for prayer meeting in a sanctuary that seats 200 with nine people, so let's move it to the fellowship hall. Well, they only had metal folding chairs, and I was at a pastor's retreat with him when I first met him, and he said this, he said, and so I've got half of my people who said, Brother Tim, I can't come because I can't sit in those chairs. It hurts me. I said, how many chairs do you need? He goes, chairs are expensive. Okay, how many chairs do you need? told me, I said, well, I've got that many plus more just sitting in a building over here. And so he came over here about a month later and picked up about 40 of those chairs. And so when I went to his ordination a few weeks ago, I met some of those people and they said, tell your church, thank you for those chairs. I'm thankful for people that God has brought across my path that I'm able to pray for and serve I think of so many pastors. I had about three or four different pastors between the last night or this morning that either texted me or I texted them. And if you want to see my text message, I didn't just do that, so I had a sermon illustration for the day. I, you, you, I will give you their phone numbers, and you can pick up the phone and call them and say, "Did Ricky? is this the first time you've ever heard from Ricky? You can come look at my text messages with him, and you will see a regular pattern. And I don't say that because it's about me. But that's where I think about Zach Tunnel at Lake Fork Baptist Church. I think about Jonathan Coleman at Mission Dorado, uh, Dorado Baptist Church out uh, way out west. I think about our church plant partners that we pray for every single Wednesday night that we have not just prayed for, but we've served and we've gone and we will go. 
I think about those that have gone from this place. I think about the washers who have gone and they're fixing to come home. And by the way, they leave tomorrow night, 1.15 in the morning, they get in on a plane in Madagascar coming home. I think about the nippers who were here last Sunday, drove back to Houston, went to the airport, got on a plane early Monday morning, and Tuesday morning we're in Osaka, Japan for the next four years. I think about the members of our church that we had shared a few weeks back on Sunday night that went and we sent to North Africa. So the question is, do we say we love? Yes, we say it, but how is it evidenced? As a church, I think we see this, but this needs to be us as well. We can't just say, well, my church does that and they do that and that group on Wednesday night does that. No, that is for you and it is for me. How else do we love? Here's a tough one. Not only is it evidenced in how we pray and how we serve and how we give and how we go, but in how we forgive. Are we willing to let go of an offense? Are we willing to forgive even someone who has hurt us so badly? To say we love should be evidenced in how we live our lives. Church, to love like Jesus loved is to live and look as Jesus did. If we say we love, then we ought to look a whole lot like Jesus in the way he loved. So the ones that are unlovely, we need to love. Not just those that are, we think, lovable, but even the ones that the world says, this person isn't worthy of love. And we say, yes, they are, because they're created in the image of God, and God loves them. Therefore, I have a responsibility to love them as well. And if we love the way Jesus loves, what John is telling us here in this text is this is an evidence that you are walking in the light. If you love your brothers and sisters of Christ here at Lane Prairie Baptist Church and throughout the world, and you don't just say it, but you do it, that is evidence that you are in the light. So maybe you find yourself here today, and you've never maybe come to that point where you have placed your faith in Jesus for forgiveness in eternal life, the question for you today is this, is are you walking in the darkness or in the light? Not, not, Not what do you just say, but what are you actually doing? What is that pattern? What is that habit of your life? Is it walking in the light or is it walking in darkness? If you say you walk in the light, but you have a pattern or habit of hatred, Instead of love, according to the scripture, you are still in the darkness. And I would beg and plead you with you today to come to the light. As Dalton and the others come and we respond, that question for you, are you in the darkness or are you in the light? What do you say, but also what is evidenced by your life? You might say, well, Ricky, I'm a member of Lane Prairie Baptist Church. Great. There's nothing in the scripture that says if you're a member of the church that you automatically walk in the light. Are you walking in darkness or are you walking in light? If you find yourself in the darkness, come to the light. No for a fact that God loves you. The God who is love loves you and he demonstrated that love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came and exemplified what it meant to love and to love perfectly. He came to this life. He lived that way apart from sin and then he went and died. He was buried and he was raised again on the third day. 
that if you will repent of your sins, turn away from them, and by faith confess Jesus is Lord, you can be forgiven today. You can step into the light. If you've never done that before, we want to give you that opportunity now. If you're here today and say, I love, if you're here as a believer and you say, hey, I love all God's people, I sure hope that it's evidenced in the way that you live your life. Maybe you're here today and God's brought you to Lane Prairie Baptist Church and he's been showing you that this is the place that he would have you come to be a member. You can come how you join the church. You come down, let us know. Hey, we we feel like we need to join Lane Prairie and we'll tell you how you can do that. But as always, the response for us now is obedience to the Spirit. The Spirit is the one that brings conviction to the believer and the unbeliever. For repentance unto righteousness, repentance unto faith, wherever it is that you need that today, I pray that you respond in obedience. So as you stand today, I pray, and then we respond through this song. Father, today, I thank you for your word, Father. I pray that it would be evidenced in our lives that we are walking in the light. Father, I pray that we might have assurance of the fact that we are in the light, that we abide in you because we have love for one another. As we've seen in the previous weeks, we can have assurance of that if we walk in obedience to your commandments. We can have assurance of the fact that we are in you also if we fully understand, if we truly and rightly see you in ourselves in light of our sin and your holiness. So, Father, today, may we respond in obedience to your spirit however we need to during this time. We pray this now in the name of Jesus.